the West refers frequently to the people's human rights. The source of the idea is the belief that if we want our rights, we must extend this benefit to all human beings. Everyone accepts there is a right to life, but the list of rights can be added to without much trouble and without many limits. If you have a good job, why ought I not have one? If one person has food for meals and a home to live in, everyone ought to have food and a home. Rights can be extended indefinitely and be introduced to cover all types of conditions. But for every right there has to be a corresponding duty on society to supply the elements that make up the right. If I have a right to life, there is at least the implicit assumption others have a duty to protect me from harm. There is also a related duty to supply society with the tools and equipment to neutralize threats to my life. It is therefore easy to proliferate rights, but difficult to supply the resources needed to ensure we can provide the rights. Rights are difficult to administrate when affixed to individuals. There is no economy of scale possible. The doctrine of individual human rights also tends to create competitions between individuals. A proliferation of rights or entitlements creates a war of all against all. Everyone wants more rights, but few want the responsibility of ensuring everyone receives what they are entitled to. Championing the rights of the poor did not give the demagogue access to the resources needed to eliminate poverty. Society pays lip service to the plight of the poor, but it is not a plight anyone has the means to eliminate. It is also an issue that can be addressed by other means than the regulatory state. It was when the narrative of human rights was effectively abandoned and replaced by identity politics, or what is called intersectionality, that rights became a significant issue in modern politics. It was not that everyone had rights. It was that there were victims, and they were entitled to justice. Moving away from human rights to the rights of victims gave politicians a more homogenous constituency. The messaging could be better customized to the group identity. If the burden for addressing the problem fell disproportionately on one group, so be it. The right of humans as human rights and the rights of intersectional groups were not formed in a vacuum. But the true source of these concepts remained unstated and out of sight. Rights as they are constructed pertain to subjects. Conception, delivery, and protection of rights assumed the existence of a regulatory state. A person may be given the right to wear a cotton dress, but unless there is an agent with the authority to ensure delivery, the right is fanciful at best. If Joe has a right to a good job, who creates it, who defines it, who delivers it? If rights are based on wants, when did a want serve as a first-order principles? Because a right is a first-order principle. The state can promise us the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But what recourse do we have if we are unhappy? What if loneliness or homelessness prevents me from being happy? What does it mean to have the right if we do not have the means? If we all have a right to be happy, there at least needs some expectation of fulfillment. We need a way to verify the basic conditions for happiness have been provided. This opens up a debate on if we can have a right to something contingent on subjective factors. We do not have a right to nice weather or security from accidents. Why would we have a right to a house when a house is contingent on the ability of others to provide housing? Is there not a conflict of interest inherent in one possibly homeless person being required to provide housing for another homeless person? It cannot be doubted that if there is one house and ten homeless families no one has a right to the house, the rights cancel each other out. If the homeless built it and you are the one to benefit from their work and purchasing power, a clear case of injustice has been done. As we live in a world where wants are infinite and resources finite, how can rights be affixed to anything that is in scarce supply? If 20 people are all bidding on a house yet the state has determined your rights preempt the market, what is your rights based on other than the military might of a federal government? But herein exists the problem. Some persons will argue the purchaser has the prior and preeminent right, others will claim the needs of a family and the poor are more important than the wants of an investor or other privileged person. In these and similar kinds of questions, we have to recall that while two contradictory positions cannot both be right, it is very possible for both of them to be wrong. In fact, there is no moral right for a person to claim an asset because he has another asset deemed of equal or greater value. But there is no moral right for the poor to claim preeminent rights due to their level of need. 
Being poor is no more virtuous than being wealthy or vice versa. Indeed, the financial condition one is in is irrelevant to determine what is right and just. But this only leaves us puzzling where the concept of rights comes from and what they are designed to do. It would appear there is a desirable state that rights theory is supposed to bring about. If we have a right to life, then threats to life contravene a compact. Otherwise, what prompts us to evoke rights legislation? If murder is wrong, then a condition in which murder is not found is the theoretical norm. Rights theory is the belief that society has an obligation to push its elements towards the societal norm. The norm of the left is centered on freedom, but freedom is not free. This position is not adopted solely because of the sacrifices our soldiers make. War is a costly enterprise, but if society wishes to be free of constraints, harm, and other nasty things, it takes expenditures of time and money to attain the social norm. The liberal state faces a problem when facilitating the delivery of rights. The state, after all, is simply a broker of sorts facilitating transfers of resources. Regardless of the spin put on what the state does, its actions consist of little more than port barrel politics centered on robbing Peter to benefit Paul. If the expropriation activities of the state were not problematical enough, its culpability for the social insanity of the left is compounded by the state's reliance on first-person narratives to identify victim groups. The subject may claim he or she is suffering and therefore a person whose rights are being violated, but this is a subjective evaluation. The person might claim to be gay or mentally troubled or going through a mental crisis, but there is no possibility of verification or validation. It is reasonable to suggest liberalism normalizes emotion and, indeed, subjectivity. But can emotional events be normalized? Can feelings serve as a social norm? Is it possible for something that is personal be considered a social norm when it cannot be extrapolated beyond its own personal narrative? If physiological events cannot serve as a social norm, then liberalism is more about normalizing deviancy than about providing people with more liberty. Indeed, freedom within the liberal understanding of things is freedom to escape normalcy. But what if the liberal conception of freedom was leashed emotion? There are those who consider happiness the highest aim. To unleash the sense of happiness is to unleash all behavior that promises to evoke even a momentary sense of happiness. Happiness is an emotion and a physiological reaction to stimuli. Happiness depends on the subject being able to do that which creates a positive physiological response. If I am to be happy, I must do things which make me happy. Therefore, my actions are guided solely by the emotional state I am in and the emotional state I wish to experience. There is evidence that emotional people reject the concept of a normal state. Emotional reactions are individual by definition. What makes me happy need not be what makes you happy. What gives me pleasure today may not give me pleasure tomorrow. There need not be any correlation between two persons' state of happiness other than their first-person narrative, that is their claim that they are happy. We are then forced to consider the question whether the concept of normalcy has any relevance to the human condition. Are we to be guided solely by feelings, or is there a higher norm we, at least as conservatives, must subscribe to? What is normal cannot be defined by the emotional responses generated by democracy and other mass events. The norm is not defined by a majority. The individual must be able to establish what is normal and not be compelled to accept a norm based on majority opinion. The norm is by definition objective because what is normal cannot be established by narrative or by consensus. If it is normal, it is beyond the reach of individuals to customize or engineer. It is normal for men to impregnate women and for women to get pregnant and bear young. All the narrative and word manipulations cannot change the norm. What is normal for matter is the resting state and if you want to change this you have to add energy to the system. The input of energy creates a new normal, but the system still tends to revert back to its normal resting state or what we call condition zero. The resting state of man is condition zero. This is absolute normal. To move to a new and more dynamic state of normalcy requires adding energy, called work, to the system. When we add work to the system, we add value. 
The resting state is net zero, and since this has no useful energy contained in it to make the system useful to us or more reflective of our needs, we have to add value to it. This makes the asset more conducive to human use. There is very little in nature that has value to us in its natural, resting state. We have to process it by adding work to make it useful or into a consumable. The rights of a citizen is the right to normalcy. To take away a right requires energy. The person who adds value to a system owns the value. To take this value or to expropriate this value requires more energy, but this is not cumulative energy but negative energy. The rights of the citizen are the natural energy state of the system or the normal state without redundancies or liabilities. Equity is established by a simple formula. Assets minus liabilities leaves equity, or E equals AL. The asset is the natural resting state of matter. The equity is the value added by work and liabilities are the claims made on this equity by an alien intruder commonly known as a liberal. As a citizen you own the value added to assets. A common asset is the citizen's political jurisdiction, which is the equity added to a geography. You own this as a citizen because you added the value to the assets to create the political entity. Those who want to claim what you created are attacking your rights as a citizen.